what you can do is you can use the body to influence the discipline. And we have to build up this baseline of what's called nervous system regulation protocols. These are not rational. You can't use the rational mind to control this this body. You can't go, okay, right, be calm, slow down, because you can't. Like if if you really know what I'm talking about here, you know what I'm talking about here. There's no amount of long term control the mind can display of the body. We've got to have a a sense of um, a sense of physiological safety in there. Welcome to the Freedom Project podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and I'm here to help you become who you're truly meant to be. So if you're into all things self-mastery, living intentionally and deliberately and creating freedom that you truly want and seek and desire, this is the podcast for you. Today is part two of my ultimate guide to becoming a more disciplined and intentional individual and like as we discussed in part one discipline is something that so many people struggle with especially those who desire more freedom it's like this double-edged sword you want to be free you want to make your choices how you want to choose them you want to have choices and you want to do what you do or do what you want to do without anyone else getting in the way that's why you truly desire freedom However, the double-edged sword of that is sticking to your own rules that you know creates the kind of person, the kind of life that you want. Jocko Willink talks about uh, discipline equals freedom. I think it's a little bit more than that. I think it's structure equals freedom. But you've got to become disciplined to create that. You've got to become disciplined in order to stick to that structure. So today, what I want to do is explain the completely hidden side of discipline the side that no one is talking about because well it's new science as part of it even though as with all of these things we seem to have known it for millennia but the science is coming out to prove it and it's one of these things that we we need to learn because so many people are ignoring it but it's the truth and through my work with well thousands of people now what I've seen is that this is the key difference or differentiator in actually becoming disciplined or failing to become disciplined. Most people think about discipline as something purely psychological that's just happening in the mind. I have a disciplined mind or I do not. I am. I make my body do what I want it to do or I make myself do what I want it to do. But what I found is that through my own personal research and through working with all my individuals is something very surprising that it's not a purely psychological thing as a quick recap of how we got to here of course listen to part one if you haven't caught up to this part right um right yet however what i see is a four to six week cycle of discipline with people where we start a new project we get very excited and you may recognize this with yourself you start a new project, you get very excited and then the discipline fades and you consider yourself undisciplined and then the cycle starts again. And we see the cyclical behavior in a few patterns. One of them is this behavioral pattern. If we just observe it, we just see ourselves looping around the same behaviors or the same types of behaviors over and over again. The other one is this emotional pattern. You see yourselves going through this anxiety into stress into or maybe it's frustration into anxiety into action into like kind of exhaustion and then background again or maybe it's a simple two-part pattern of action and inaction maybe you see this time and time again yourself i see this pattern in clients too and it seems this kind of peaks and trough of of discipline and sticking to a plan then not and breaking through that is usually the key to a lot of success if you can make yourselves like if you're listening to this you're not thick if you're listening to this you've got all these advantages and it's not knowing what to do it's actually making yourself do what you want to do we live in this incredible age where information is completely abundant and you can go on chat gpt you can go on google and find out all the information you need but actually applying it is a completely different factor so i want to really give you this because it's, uh, it's something that so many people struggle with. So the way I like to start with any problem when I'm dealing with my clients is to think about 
I think about it in terms of this, that I'm going to give you this term that's kind of, to use British slang, a little bit wanky. But what it is, is a is the, is the true way of thinking about this. So there's this term phylogenetic. And what that means is that you can think about our body in different layers and even our brain in different layers. And the most inner layer is the one that evolved first. So you think about evolutionarily the oldest part of us. And then in the middle, you have a kind of like a mid pattern. And then you have the evolutionary newest part on the outside of us. Okay, so this 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 kind of phylogenetic way of approaching us. The long, the short of this is the deepest root part of us is our nervous system. That is the oldest part of us. Then it's kind of our psychology, our emotions, and then it's philosophy and how we act very rationally. So on one end, we have the purely physical. That's where I like to start with these things. Then on the other side, we have the very rational, the philosophical. We have the psychological somewhere in the middle because that's the, in my mind, the, the communicator between both those worlds. But let's start this in the very physiological, the biological aspect. And what we have here is the deepest part of that, like I said, is our nervous system. You think about this nervous system as including your brain, but the way of communicating between your mind and your body. So it's this communication pathway, constantly going between your conscious mind and your body. And this is a two-way conversation. This is a key, and this is going to come up quite a few times today. This is a two-way conversation. It's not just your mind telling your body what to do and it obeying. What this is, is your mind telling your body what to do, sometimes it obeys, and your body is telling your mind what to think. And sometimes it obeys. It's this constant two-way conversation. If you want proof, just look at how you are when you're tired or hungry. Or like think about gut biome and the way that's influencing the, the modern conversation of the brain. Often talked about as your second brain or your third brain. In truth, it could even be the first brain. So we have this nervous system, this constant communication going between mind and body over and over and over again it's this consistent this consistent pathway of communication and one key element of that is the vagus nerve the vagus nerve is essentially well vagus translates as wandering from the latin and it's called this because it goes to all aspects of the body it has this deep root in your brain stem and then seems to affect and to reach to every single element of your body and the vagus nerve is heavily associated with what's called your parasympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic is like your rest and digest. Think about this as the brakes on the car. I like to, because I'm a basic bitch, call it kind of the slow the fuck down system. It's like the, whoa, Tom, chill out, slow down, breathe. And that word is key because it influences and is influenced by breathing. It's like your slowdown. What it's trying to do is when there is no, when it perceives safety and there is no threat, that's key. When it perceives safety and there is no threat, it's trying to get you to calm down and slow down. When this vagus nerve is firing, when it's kind of activated fully is one way of thinking about it, although there'll be a load of neurologists listening to this and going, oh, well, that's not quite right, but this is the way I like to explain it and how my clients seem to get it. When it's kind of firing heavily, what's happening is it like this communication is saying, hey, the world is safe. I perceive no threat, so I'm not sensing any threat around me. When you, It's called a high vagal tone, okay? And this is associated with creativity and a certain amount of risk, and it's uh, a level of vulnerability that you can display. And in terms of our conversation around discipline, it means you can be highly disciplined because you can take the action that you need to take consistently without risk of um, of punishment or danger or that word again, threat, which I'm going to be saying over and over and over again. I call this your level zero. 
this is where you want to be if you're going to be disciplined like we we need to fluctuate this is kind of a side note we need to fluctuate in and out of the, the the zones to action within the world and get shit done in lots of other ways but this level zero is where the baseline of your discipline comes from and if you're not consistently finding yourself here you're going to really struggle to be disciplined if you don't feel safe and free and open to risk and like you can always return to this place of safety you will really really struggle to maintain your discipline so this is the kind of the the home base however you can't live here imagine if your imagine if your ancestors never evolved this um or just stuck in this level zero they would have died years and years ago you wouldn't have no ancestors they would be um they would be dead they would be eaten they wouldn't have perceived any risk so we need to get out of this occasionally and to do that we go to what's called our sympathetic nervous system this is like a fight or flight you've probably heard it before this is like the i need to change something because i've again the key word here is perceived threat there may not actually be threat out there but my body not my mind but my body has perceived threat and what happens there is the break of the vagus nerve is kind of let off and your oh shit let's do something let's get out of here version of you kicks in the first level it reaches is this fight or flight this is like your frantic action just in terms of um in terms of what it was evolved for it's like get out of here swing some fists like punch fight kick scream get out of here as much as in any way possible how this relates to your discipline challenge is it looks like the kind of the rushing at the beginning it looks like that buzz of like i can do this i can actually get this i can get excited uh it looks it feels like being highly caffeinated which i kind of am now it's that cortisol so the stress associated with that and the adrenaline of like let's get up and move our bodies it looks like really frantic action it's hustling grind that's really what it is how many times have you found yourself fluctuating between or t- actually before we get to the, that part how many fi- times you found yourself in this place i've got to hustle and grind to get myself out of this discipline rut or lack of discipline rut it's meant for fending off predators which is why it's so exhausting to be in and why you can't maintain it consistently even if you look at someone like i don't know david goggins and think i could be that person i could have that level of fight for david goggins is a genetic freak in the best way possible i'm glad the world has him but you are not him and trying to replicate him i don't think is a recipe for success so we don't want to be relying on this hustle and grind fight mentality to get out of our lack of discipline struggles so that's the first level if your body perceives threat if it senses threat there's a kind of a fancy term for it neuroception if your body is picking up on threat that's what it'll do it'll go to that level 1 it will fight if your body doesn't perceive any threat if that works then hopefully it returns to that level 0 the threat is gone we can just kind of act creatively we can socially engage we can regulate our emotions better because we're back in that level 0 if however the level 1 does not solve your your challenges if it does not make you feel safe in terms of your physiological safety you enter level 2 which is you may have seen this a ton of times if you got a cat and the cat brings in a mouse but that's your play dead phase it's i'm going to lie down and pretend to be dead it's not a conscious decision it's an unconscious decision to do so the nervous system between you and that mouse playing dead is for evolutionary purposes essentially identical but if you are so terrified and if your body perceives so much threat you will shut down this does not look like you lying on the floor and your heart rate slowing down and you um you kind of just really giving up in in the way that the mouse does and the hope that the cat leaves you alone for you guys struggling with discipline this looks like a complete shutdown it looks like 
an immobilization in terms of I'm not going to be disciplined. It looks like inaction. It looks like and feels like laziness. And it can be best categorized by the sense of I know what to do, but I can't make myself do it. So most people that I end up working with have found themselves trapped in this level one or level two cycle. They go from extreme panic and I've got to get my shit together. I'm going to be more disciplined. I'm going to really punch out this into level two of, okay, I'm going to play dead. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to like avoid all the things that I need to do. And they just fluctuate between that. What's more is they've probably got, and both those sides, by the way, are, are sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight. They're both elements of the sympathetic nervous system. They're just how accelerated that is. So you can become stuck in them if all your habits lead you to that sympathetic state. Remember, this is a two-way conversation. So if you're highly caffeinated consistently throughout the day, you're going to be in that sympathetic state. If you are addicted to that crushing kind of um, the intensity of a workout, you can find yourself in that state consistently. There's another way into this, which is not really for this discussion because it's not my expertise, but it's if you've experienced trauma, uh, if you've experienced emotional trauma, psychological trauma, physical trauma, you can become stuck in this state too. But for most of the people that I'm working with, it's more the case of they're perceiving threat financially or emotionally. So I'll give you two examples. If the business fails, then I'll be ruined um, or they, there's kind of an emotional threat. If I really take action on this and go, go in on my dreams, then my partner will leave me. Something like that. There's the kind of emotional side to it. If they're found so, like stuck in those places, it's really, really difficult to get out of. So they fluctuate in this level one, level two of the stress and kind of action. So remember, this is a two-way conversation. Here's the kind of the good news here. This is if the, the mind is telling the body to do something, the body can tell the mind to do something. So what we have to do is encourage ourselves slowly. This is a slow process. This is not instant, although you can feel some immediate relief upon kind of using these techniques. What you can do is you can use the body to influence the discipline. And we have to build up this baseline of what's called nervous system regulation protocols. These are not rational. You can't use the rational mind to control this, this body. You can't go, okay, right, be calm slow down because you can't like if if you really know what i'm talking about here you know what i'm talking about here there's no amount of long-term control the mind can display of the body we've got to have a a sense of um a sense of physiological safety in there and the way we do this i'll, I'll read out a few techniques this is way too complex for me to go into in terms of actually prescribing things now the way i work with my clients is i put them through a testing phase i analyze everything they're going through and i I extract the tools that I think will work for them. We we try them. If they work, fantastic. We'll adapt them a little bit. If they don't work, we'll change the script and we'll try it um, in a different way um, because I've, I've kind of seen what's worked and what hasn't worked for so many people that I can kind of shortcut this. But there's a few places to start here. The first one is breath work. I said this is a two-way conversation. If you can slow down the breath, if you can breathe through your nose, if you can practice conscious breathing, this is a fantastic way into this. Second one, and this is something that has huge, huge impacts, NSDR, non-sleep deep rest or yoga nidra. Andrew Huberman has popularized this magnificently. He's done a great job with this. This is essentially, nidra means sleep in Sanskrit. So it's essentially yoga sleep, lying down and chilling out and having someone taking you through a relaxation process. That's that. Play is one aspect of it. And by play, this can mean climbing. It can mean dancing. Dancing is a fantastic one. It can be martial arts. Anything, you see puppies do this the whole time, where they play with each other. They make eye contact, and that regulates their nervous system. They learn to bring it down. They learn to go, oh, that was a bit aggressive. We'll slow down. And that kind of pattern of activating the sympathetic and then bring down to the parasympathetic really, really works. Sleep hygiene is a huge one. So getting outside into light exposure, sleeping well, um, not having glaring blue lights in front of your eyes is huge for you cold and heat exposure again a fantastic tool hydration caffeine physical activity these are huge huge influences so that is the two-way conversation 
that consistently happens and we need to find our kind of icon physiological buttons which ones do you need to press that's what we need to be doing so like i said when i work with my clients in the adventurepreneur collective of which there is just one space left to april by the way what i do is i will track this i'll put them through a testing phase i'll use my fancy spreadsheets and i will see exactly what's happening to those people and then i'll pull out the protocols for them what i'd recommend for you is the very scientific measure of or method of throw shit at a wall and see what sticks try those protocols if you want to um, get the kind of the shorter path if you want to shortcut this path and find out exactly how to do it to you and how to kind of cut all the faff and the learning and the expertise associated with it join the adventurepreneur collective i genuinely know of no other place that's going to help you become more disciplined in this way and approach it from the ground up which needs to be done that is an option and if you want to do that reach out to me on instagram um, at tom foxley f-o-x-l-e-y and you shall find me so what's next in this uh, what did I call this? The ultimate guide to discipline. Firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the psychological aspect. We're going to start talking about stories and the unconscious mind and how this can influence the, the the challenge of discipline. And then in the next episode, we're going to go into the more philosophical approach. So how can we train that ability to have temperance? And then we'll go through a completely different approach to that just to kind of um, summarize that and bring it all in. Anyway, I hope this was a useful podcast episode for you. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review wherever you can, recommend it to your friends, or even share it on social media. And I shall speak to you very soon.